All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Vincent with HOK. And uh, before we get started, this will be live streamed. Is that correct? Correct. So just housekeeping, could you please silence your phone or put it on, on buzzer? I just checked mine. And I also wanted to thank everyone on our team and the Metropolis team and our sponsor for, for making this event happen because there was a lot of work that went into getting this right. So thank you everyone for putting this together. I'm going to hand this over to Daniel and we'll uh, start the panel discussion part. Awesome. Well, thank you, Vin. Uh, like Vin mentioned, my name is Daniel Weissman and I work for Metropolis Magazine and thrilled to be here in Washington, D.C., but specifically in HOK. And, um, would like to thank all of you for joining us, um, both here live, but also live on Facebook. So welcome to all of those tuning in on the live stream. Our topic this morning is designing to recruit and retain in the age of Amazon. And I'm excited to introduce our panel and moderator. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm excited to introduce our moderator who will introduce our panel. But before I do, I wanted to take a moment to bring everyone up to speed on what the Metropolis Think Tank program is. Think Tank is a continuing education series that travels to leading architecture and interior design firms throughout North America. In total, we travel to nine cities producing 27 discussions in the calendar year, focusing on the areas of education, wellness, hospitality, urban design, and workplace. And so today's discussion will focus on workplace, but many of those tenets that I just mentioned will be touched on as well. Think Tank brings together architects, designers, planners, developers, policymakers, and industry ex experts with the aim of challenging all stakeholders to examine the strengths and weaknesses of current design thinking. Together, our aim is to chart the path forward and search for human-centered design. Following today's panel discussion, we, will, we have left time for questions and answers, so I would encourage you to um, keep that in mind as our panel grapples with today's topic. I would also like to take a moment to thank our Think Tank sponsors who make this program and all of our Think Tank discussions possible. So with that, our Washington DC sponsors are BIFMA, DuPont, DXV Growy, and Ver Steel. And at the conclusion of today's discussion, I'll introduce our sponsors who are with us in the audience today. Further on your chairs, you'll see that you have um, swag bags that has uh, information on our Think Tank sponsors, some things about uh, that HOK provided, as well as the event program that has the bio and headshots um, and some additional information on today's discussion. I would encourage everybody to um, keep the conversation going using the hashtag ThinkTank2019, both on Twitter and Facebook. Like we mentioned, this is being live streamed. So without further ado, let me introduce our moderator for this morning's discussion, Lila Allen, Lila Allen Managing Director of Metropolis. Hi, Dan. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming out in a very muggy day in D.C. to be here bright and early. Um, I'm very excited about this panel. I have four experts here on workplace design, um, and in your chairs, you actually have our most recent workplace issue. Um, that's the issue that went to Neocon, and there are some really special office projects in there, some of which I think really kind of paint the direction of the industry. So be sure to check those out because we put a lot of work into it and we're very happy with how it turned out. So here in DC, obviously, Amazon is top of mind. Um, and many companies are asking the question of how they can recruit and retain with companies like Amazon on the horizon. So I'm going to let my panelists do most of the talking here and laying the groundwork. Um, <clears throat> but for introductions, I have uh, Stephen Beecham here, who's the Director of Design for Interiors um, here at HOK. Behind him, I have Caroline Pelly, Design and Space Standards Lead at Wells Fargo. Behind her, Michelle Kolbinski, Director of Corporate Resources for Freddie Mac. And at the end of the table, we have Tina Walker, uh, who is the Real Estate and Facilities Director for BAE Systems. Um, I'd just like to start with Michelle. Um, can you kind of paint a picture of what um, Freddie Mac is seeing in terms of challenges for recruitment right now um, as a kind of financial tech business? So, um, 40% of our staff is IT. So we think of ourselves as a financial tech company. Um, and what that means is that we're competing for talent. Um, so what that means 
would we compete in a market, in a highly competitive market? So we have to ask ourselves, what do our employees want? Right? They want to be inspired. They want a sense of purpose. They want to be connected to their organization. They want to believe in the mission and the brand of the organization. So they want to be able to, um, they want to be able to continually learn. So for us, that translates in um, solutions as to how we approach our corporate workplace environment and how do we sort of integrate brand, mission, community, choice, mm -hmm. physiological and psychological comfort in our, our workplace environment. Yes. Uh, Steven, can you speak a little to how you're seeing this manifest with your clients? So for a lot of our clients, um, we're finding that we are in a fusion period, mm. okay, where it's not just about one way of working or another way of working. We have multiple generations that we need to accommodate. We also have multiple working styles that we need to accommodate. Um, if you've ever heard the uh, expressions corporatality or resimercial, mm. okay, uh, they're, they're a little hokey, but they are kind of talking to the common trend where uh, you are creating spaces for choice. Mm. And uh, you're creating spaces for choice to attract and retain and to give people the ability to work uh, however and wherever they'd like to work. So even in our own studios, we've got people working at these high top tables here, but sometimes they'll be working at their desks or sometimes they'll be working in these booths or sometimes they'll be working in one of the cocoons. They've got a variety of different types of uh, options for them to work in. Mm. And that helps support a healthy environment. Right. Um, Tina, at BAE, S BAE Systems, um, I know that you're dealing with a, a slightly more um, conservative atmosphere what are some of the challenges in adopting this kind of working style? Um, well, we're, we're not adopting it. It's actually our working style today. Mm -hmm. um, but we, you know, as far as bringing in new talent, that's, that's where the challenge is, right? Um, so what we are doing, even within the conservative space, we are creating um, spaces for collaboration, um, spaces where people can get away if they want to get away. But we are um, mostly office intensive. And um, those particular spaces that, that we are looking to create will help some collision points for, for them to um, you know, find their way and also run into people for more informal collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, Caroline, you're working on a project now in Charlotte that certainly brings in some of these ideas. Can you give us a little background on that and how it ties in with these ideas? Yeah, great. Uh, so we've got a project right now in Charlotte with Wells Fargo um, that is a tech center for us in that market. And uh, it's, it's been interesting because what we've noticed over the last two years within our organization is similar to what um, Michelle was saying with the, um, uh, with the um, technology recruitment. Um, in particular being a challenge. And in our Charlotte market, we, Wells Fargo is definitely not known as a, Wells, as, as a technology company. So one of the opportunities that we have in that market is to really take this new uh, project that we've got and make it a showcase to um, kind of announce to that market that we really are uh, a tech company, that we um, are engaged and, uh, and, and innovating in that space. And we're using this project to really help bring awareness in the market to, um, to that presence, um, to the tech space um, by looking at activating our street level fronts. Um, we've got large glass areas there that are really um, uh, going to be um, actively kind of curated and programmed from an engagement perspective. We have the, the, you know, the game rooms and those sorts of spaces down there and then also drop in spaces for folks to, to come in and leverage. So there should be a lot of um, engaged activity there. Um, we're also looking at um, how we can integrate our brand at the street level mm -hmm. and really propel out and kind of uh, make, it, make that presence really known. Um, uh, there. So uh, how to activate those spaces is really our key right now. Great. Um, going back to this idea of resi Marshall for a moment, I'm wondering um, what other sectors are you all looking to to kind of take lessons for workplace right now? Uh, Stephen, I'll start with you. 
So workplace environments, as I said, it's a fusion. Mm -hmm. okay? um, and so we look at several sectors. The hospitality sector, obviously, mm -hmm. is um, the hospitality sector is influencing almost every <coughs> every other sector of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. whether it's uh, a healthcare environment, a research center, mm -hmm. um, a law firm, um, a banking office, uh, just like technology is, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, you know, the, the idea that a bank is a bank or a, a banking company is a technology company, these are all kind of the fuzzy lines mm -hmm. that kind of cross in when we talk about kind of fusion. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also looking at the education sectors. Um, in earlier discussion with the group, we were talking about how um, we're doing a, we just finished a, um, uh, a science center for Penn State University. And at the same time, we were doing a major campus for GlaxoSmithKline. The same parallels of how we were planning the space were exacting themselves both in the education environment as well as in the office environment. And so the parallels are that uh, the students coming out of school are already familiar with that type of work environment. They're no longer having to be, this is how I work in school, and I'm going to totally restructure how I work mm. because this is the construct of the corporate environment. The corporate environment is learning from the education environments, just like the corporates and corporate environments are learning from the hospitality environments. And when I say that, it's not just about the aesthetics, although the aesthetics is um, very important. We're doing a project for McKinsey in Atlanta right now where it is almost exclusively a residential type environment, mm -hmm. okay? And that is the key word for the client. Now, when you do a commercial space that's residential, you run into kind of, and BIFMA's here, so they know what I'm talking about. Uh, you run into issues of, well, I can't go to West Elm to buy this or that. You know, I have to think in commercial terms, in terms of flame spreads and all this other kind of stuff. So that kind of, but that's an evolutionary thing that as, as we move on with design and as uh, this fusion kind of plays out, that you will see more and more type products, more and more environments, which are uh, catering to a, a variety of different type of people. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle, I believe you also looked at education um, for inspiration with the recent we project. We did. We looked at it, and we looked at both education and hospitality, so I absolutely agree with what Stephen's saying. They're both very influential in different ways, right? So if I start off with education, it's about, and this isn't my term, this is a borrowed term, but the me in the we space. Mm you know, and thinking about how students work together at universities and what are those environments and how do we translate those into a flexible corporate environment. From a hospitality perspective, we're looking at it from the perspective of the employee experience, the holistic, and as Caroline pointed out this morning in our dialogue, you know, from the moment you get up, where are you working? Do you, know, do you have a 9 a.m. meeting at the office or can you take it from home? So really thinking about that employee experience from the start of their workday to the end of their workday, including commute, food, beverage, and then finally I would add retail because mm -hmm. we're thinking about how does brand integrate and help communicate corporate culture, which gets back to attracting and retaining, mm -hmm. right, purpose, mission, values. How is that brand integrated into your workplace environment and prioritized across the spaces? Right. Uh, Tina, um, I know that this is a conversation for you all as well. Um, uh, you all are a very technology forward company. You have, a, uh, I believe, a very generous work remotely, work from home policy. Um, can you talk about how that's kind of playing into the workplace that you're developing currently? Sure. Um, so, so one of the things that, that we did um, about a year and a half ago is we actually serve, surveyed our uh, DC Metro employees to find out what was important to them in the workplace. So there was about 2,500 people surveyed um, across our, our buildings in the area. Um, number one thing was commute, if you can all imagine that, right? Um, so, so where is that office going to be located? And, um, 
you know, so we so we really looked at that, and and what we did, we did a heat map, and we looked at you know where is the best place for us, and where do our employees currently live. Mm -hmm. So Falls Church ended up being that hot spot for us, um, although we did have um, people um, that that were really losers, right? They they needed to commute longer. Um, the other piece of that is we are no longer going to be on the metro line, um, so we have a lot of people who don't own cars. So how do we deal with that? Um, so, so a lot of the things that we're we're looking at now, we're, we're not moving into the space until um, mid next year. But what are what we're trying to do is really figure out um, and create a great employee experience, not only in the workspace but also um, getting to that workspace. Um, so we're looking at things like shuttle buses um, to and from the closest metro, um, using Uber Pool as part of the um, commuter benefits, um, and various things like that. Once we get inside the space, um, you know, we really need to be mindful of today we're in four different locations. Um, every location is close by to, um, you know, to food trucks, um, to post offices, to dry cleaners, those kinds of things. And those are the things that people, um, you know, obviously go get their lunch and maybe run to the post office, drop off a package, pick up their dry cleaning, whatever the case may be. So we really need to bring that into our new location somehow. So creating that overall employee experience um, is really, really important. Um, other than those external amenities, we are creating some internal amenities to the space. Um, we are, we're, we're going to have an employee cafeteria, which is new for us. We are going to be creating a full floor of conference center, um, which it being the headquarters um, is an opportunity for us to bring some of our 30,000 employees from across the, the US, Europe, and Sweden into our headquarters so they can experience what that is like. Um, so we really, really want to create that experience, um, you know, from, from the moment they either get on the train or in their car into the building and then back home. So, um, so those are some things that we're really working on. Yeah. Um, Caroline and Tina, I know both of you are working on projects that use agile uh, methods of working. Um, what are some of the strategies or, or challenges that you're seeing um, in maintaining an efficient use of space? Um, what we're finding is that, you know, if we're maintaining, you know, efficient thresholds, you know, number of square feet per seat, right? Um, and we're, we're striving for density, then what we're running into is a conflict with basically a lack of perceived privacy, well, actually not even any real privacy, acoustical concerns from employees. We get a lot of complaints around that. We have employees that complain they can't concentrate. Mm. So when we start looking at balancing those ratios, and right now we're targeting a minimum of one to one. So one dedicated seat, we are 100% dedicated, unlike you know our Wells Fargo partners. <laughs> um, but we're looking at a one to one dedicated seat to alternate workplace seat. Um, what that does is it drives our ratios up. So thinking about how are we designing those dedicated seats to support and allow for perceived privacy heads down concentration while mitigating the square footage that those spaces take up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably our biggest challenge. Um, for us, we're doing um, a few things. One is, I think that when we use the word agile, um, mm -hmm. it probably has about as many definitions <laughs> as there are people that use the word. Um, and so what I will start off with is that within Wells, how we're thinking of agile is more from what are the working styles of the individuals that are uh, performing the work and less about um, how is, uh, are, it's less about are we designing agile space, it's more about how are we supporting folks that are working in a more agile way. And with agile, it could be that our lines of businesses are um, using kind of an agile inspired type of a work environment, which basically for them is just meaning that they need more collaboration space together, mm -hmm. um, all the way up through um, you know groups that are really using the formal agile methodology, um, paired programming, scrum teams, um, et cetera all the way, you know, kind of toward the more formal thing. And then we have um, every flavor in the spectrum um, in the middle that we're trying to support as well. So from a corporate properties perspective, trying to um, identify solutions that can bridge 
between the agile inspired all the way up to the formal agile has been challenging. Um, the good thing about, um, I, I think, the, the spectrum that we're trying to bridge is that a lot of the solutions that support um, both or kind of all, all of that spectrum tend to be similar solutions. It's really the ratios of how many of those solutions are you providing in the space. So uh, at Wells, what we're in the process of doing in our new project in, in Charlotte is addressing um, supporting agile work through what we're calling workplace neighborhood choice, which um, will be 100% unassigned seating. Um, and uh, every uh, team member or every group is assigned into a neighborhood. Neighborhoods are uh, typically between 35 and 50 work seats. Um, so every individual will be assigned into a neighborhood and the neighborhood becomes their home base. Their personal storage will be there, their artifacts will be there, um, but within the neighborhood there will be no assigned seats at all. Um, with this, um, you know, certainly programming has been different to determine how many individuals do we assign to each neighborhood becomes um, a challenge for us. Uh, but with that, what, we're, what we look at is we look at um, their existing behavior. So we're looking at utilization from a perspective of um, uh, what are the peak days uh, in, the, in the prior six months that those businesses have achieved, and can we provide a one-to-one -one seat to person relationship for 95% of the days being at that peak day or, or less. So we're looking to um, uh, program in such a way where we're anticipating that 5% of a year you may have some days where there is an overflow um, needed, but we want 95% of the time for there to be seats for everyone who's likely to show up, or at least who has previously shown up. Um, so within our building, we'll have about 2,400 seats, and right now we're, we're anticipating that we will um, see utilization of uh, supporting about 3,600 people um, with that space. Of course, we'll be monitoring as we go to see how that, how that happens. Um, but the design of the space really, as Stephen was saying, is all about the choice of um, providing a variety of different spaces. So within each neighborhood, we have um, a combination of bench seating, 120 seats, uh, some office seat seating, uh, focus rooms, huddle rooms, small conference rooms, open collaborative mm -hmm. spaces, mm -hmm. really a variety of spaces within each of the neighborhoods. So you have line of sight to see all of these spaces and choose as your day moves and as you kind of maneuver through the space. So. Yes, absolutely. One of the things that I, I think is a big concern for our organization that I just wanted to touch on real quickly is health safety. Mm. One of the key aspects of Agile space is flexibility. And as you get into technology teams especially, they want to be able to physically adjust their spaces and environments to support their work style. So for us, finding that balance between health safety and flexibility is very difficult. And as you know, we were even talking this morning, working with our furniture manufacturers to identify solutions that allow what I think of as kind of a controlled flexible environment um, that protects the facility and the employee is really ideal, but it's, we're not there. Right. Yeah. Um, Stephen, can you address maybe some of the strategies that sure. you've worked with? Well, like for example, at the, on the Wells Fargo project, to talk about life safety, we're doing subtle things. Like um, we were talking in the earlier meeting, we were talking about how whiteboards or things that are movable mm -hmm. wind up in hallways, mm -hmm. blocking egress paths and so forth. So uh, we're doing subtle things like changing the tone of the carpet that define the corridor path, that define the work path or the, the workplace kind of area. So just subtle things uh, to give cues to the employees that this is where you go, this is, this is where you work, this is where you travel. Just something similar, it's just something very subtle like that. And on the, the Wells Fargo project, we also, um, what Caroline didn't mention is that we have a public floor, uh, the street floor that, that she talked about earlier. That street floor also serves as overflow Okay, when the pods get too busy one day, you can work down in the forum, or you can work in the game room, and so, or you can work in the, uh, the temp, right, the workshop. So mm -hmm. there are different spaces, even on other floors, that you can go to. What, what I really like about what they're doing at the Wells Fargo, uh, on the Wells Fargo project is by creating these neighborhoods, 
you're creating your sense of place. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we were talking earlier about is how do you make, um, in agile working, how do you make your space a home? How do you make it feel personal? Um, you've got a floor that's got 350 seats on it. Theoretically, in agile working, all your stuff goes in a locker and it doesn't sit on your desk, so all your tchotchkes and whatnot don't happen. In the neighborhood concept, because you're breaking down the construct into a smaller, more manageable um, number, and we're also giving the groups the opportunity to customize their space, to make it their own, to make it feel like this is their neighborhood. Right. Okay, and all of that kind of leads to the ability of this is where I want to be, this is where I belong, this is my home, and it's not just an impersonal, here's my desk. Mm. Great. Um, Tina, I'm wondering if you can talk some, I, I believe that you are technically, you report to HR at your job. How do these working styles work hand in hand with human resources? What's the give and take with design and developing policies that work with that design? So, um, so going back to 2014, um, we, we did a, a building consolidation and uh, we moved our HR organization from a full office intensive environment to a totally open plan. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody from um, you know, an analyst to a vice president was sitting in, is now sitting in an open um, seven by seven workstation. Um, as you can imagine, that created a little bit of anxiety um, <laughs> with some of the people. But um, one of the things we, we did is, is we, we um, implemented the neighborhood solution um, with that particular design. Um, and, and that really helped. Um, we also put in place um, a, a work from home policy. Uh, so for people um, who just needed more privacy, um, they had the ability to work from home. In fact, the, our benefits organization, um, they, they actually um, come into the office three days a week. Mm -hmm. So that group of people sits together three days a week and the other two days they're, they're um, at home, obviously depending on, on schedules and meetings and that type of thing. Um, so, so the policies that were put in place by HR were really to, um, you know, to benefit the employee and make sure that they had the primary, or the working conditions that they needed to support the work that they were doing. Um, within um, within the space, we we did create, you know, phone rooms and small collaboration spaces, um, video teleconference, that kind of thing. Um, so on the video teleconference thing, you know, you can pull in those people that are working from home if they need to be um, seen in 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 a meeting. So, mm -hmm. um, so those policies um, were really, really started by the HR group because of their working condition, um, and and it's it's actually held, and and that's actually one of the tools um, that we use to recruit employees. That flexibility is so important. Um, we even have have impl implemented a um, 980 work schedule, so um, employees have every other Friday off. Um, and as you know, in the DC area, just getting to doctor's appointments and things like that, trying to do those things on a Saturday and Sunday, it's near impossible. Um, so, so we do allow that flexibility within, within the group and, and that's, that's really helped and, and a lot of people, I believe, um, stay within the organization because they do have that flexibility, so. I also want to say that um, more and more HR is involved in the planning of policy of how we design spaces. Mm -hmm. Didn't used to be, it used to be kind of a real estate solution. But more and more now with the, um, the inclusion of well, mm. um, HR, um, food services are all part of the solution. And it's not just the, just the cycle of the real estate group is determining this, the finance group, you know, in, in many cases, real estate reports up to finance, mm -hmm. okay? So then it comes down to a number. But then you have to balance that number with the human quotient. And so um, I'm really happy that, you know, HR is now more and more involved at the table mm -hmm. when we're talking about making these kind of major paradigm shifts in how, in how we work. The BAE campus is a consolidation from four sites to one site, and it's almost a vertical campus now. Mm -hmm. We're creating that, that, that central hub, that central street, 
um, becomes the important thread that will connect all of their employees. And that's not just a, a, a finance solution, it's also a social solution that HR helps influence. And, and there's also a security solution with that as well. Um, you know, as, as a defense contractor, you know, we, we have to badge in and out of all of our spaces. And with the conference center um, and the cafeteria area, we wanted people to be able to roam. So if you're coming in for a training, you're an international uh, visitor um, or, or a visitor who is not an employee of the company, um, we wanted them to be able to walk in the space I have access to restrooms, cafeteria, coffee, those kinds of things. Whereas today, in each one of our locations, um, even um, members of our PLC board who come to visit um, quarterly, we have to escort to the restrooms. Um, so, so we really needed to create that space that they could free roam and and not feel like you know they were under our watchful eye. So, um, so it's very important to to really look at that as well. Have you run into any challenges um, in convincing leadership that this is worth investing in and that you know these people actually are working when they're sitting on the sofa or so so that's something that um, that we discussed earlier culturally um, you know we we are in, in the defense industry, we tend to be a little bit dated, um, and and we, you know, as you're looking at these collaborative spaces, um, you know, it, it always comes back to the people who've been with the company for for 20 years, 15 to 30 years, really. Um, going to stand by the water cooler and having a conversation was not seen as productive, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you go sit on a couch and work on your laptop and have somebody think that you're actually being productive? Um, so we, we've you know, talked about that a bit, um, and, and we, really, we really need to get our leadership moving in that direction. Um, you know, I, we were talking earlier about you know, how everyone is now kind of working on the fly. Um, but we still have executives who um, are single income families and they still have um, spouses who take care of all the stuff that needs to happen you know, for the household. Um, so they may not necessarily know all of that. So, so we're gonna slowly teach them how, how that needs to look and, and that it is okay to work in any, any location. Um, flexible working, collaboration, these are all really big buzzwords with products at the moment. I would love to hear, um, definitely from you, Stephen, but anyone who wants to weigh in, because I think you probably all have opinions. Do you think product is keeping up with the change, uh, uh, the, the pace of change in the workplace? <laughs> and, and what would you like to see be better developed if can I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I can I can I start? Yes, you can start. <laughs> um, it's funny. Tina and I were in uh, Chicago last week, um, looking at product, and there seems to be a lack of understanding that people actually use computers mm. in furniture design. Uh, half the showrooms, there wasn't uh, one computer on the desk, right. one monitor. Monitors are getting bigger, they're not getting smaller. Mm -hmm. We're using more monitors than we've ever used in the past. Yet some of the products, uh, the products tend to be, what we saw was that the products tend to be all about kind of collaboration and not necessarily about the me component. Mm -hmm. How do I actually do my work? How do I work at a desk like this with monitors and then to be able to come over here and have a conversation with this person and then have, so we will wind up doing a custom solution, which seems ironic in this day and age that we have to design a custom solution mm -hmm. so that when you come into the office that your back is not to the door, that you have multiple ways to lay your computer out within a, within a configuration. So it's, it's, it's interesting, but for that, for, for BAE, we are gonna wind up doing a custom solution though, so that you have the me space, mm -hmm. okay, uh, where you can see the door and you don't feel a sense of like you're being vacant, especially for BAE um, where uh, screen privacy is paramount, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and then at the same time have a space for we, right. okay, uh, within the environments. So I think furniture manufacturers are, um, and I hope there aren't any 
here, sorry, if there are. Uh, but, but listen up if there are. Uh, you know, that, that they're not keeping up with that component mm. of, the, they're creating a lot of social type furniture and uh, the furniture industry is going through a huge change right now because it used to be that 20% of the budget was ancillary product. Now it's closer to 60%, mm. okay? And the single line manufacturers, the Herman Millers, the Steel Cases, the Knolls, are having to retool themselves, so at, which is why you're seeing so much emphasis on partnering, you know. And uh, you know, Noel buys Muto, and uh, Coalesce has become such a huge component at um, Steelcase, and so and you know, Hayworth has Hayworth Pro, um, Solutions, mm -hmm. okay, you know, Poltrona Frau. So all of the companies are trying to catch up with the fact that the workplace environment and the way that we work is so different from the way that the traditional manufacturers have been set up for years. Right. Um, I would love to talk too about how you prioritize a spend on a project. Um, Caroline, would you like to kind of address what, you know, what you think is worth investing in for specifically for recruiting and retaining talent? Yeah. And um, where you're kind of willing to kind of maybe skimp a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Where, where are we? Where are we? Be? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So for us, um, I think that we have successfully made the argument now that we've got to invest in the um, in the we space. Um, first and foremost, and in creating those large areas. So, you know, for us taking an entire floor as um, a central collaborative area with the cafeteria, with the forum, with the workshop, with the, you know, our Tech Express space and um, in the game area space, um, that investment in that real estate is a huge part of the what will become the overall success factor of the building for the occupants. So it's all about the team member experience of, you know, literally how do you walk into the space and how does the how does the space make your life easier um, and provide you the options. So uh, things where we may be. Um, uh, cutting back are looking at things like um, do we need as much storage in all of the spaces mm -hmm. um, and do uh, you know we, we have offices in our neighborhoods they're unassigned offices there is zero storage in any of those spaces so you know we've we've completely retooled how we're providing and what we're providing in the way of space to support how we want the the folks to um, act and then we're reinvesting those dollars in um, uh, in the finishes, in the um, tactile um, elements, in the biophilia that we're providing into all of the shared spaces um, around. So, um, and honestly, in the technology, so that we can further um, enable the mobility and the ability for folks to um, to to virtually collaborate which is, for us, with an organization of 270,000 team members, <laughs> um, the vast majority of our collaboration actually happens virtually. So um, you know, we're looking for ways to uh, enable that um, in a huge way. So that's, that's how we're addressing. Uh, Michelle, has your experience been similar? Yes, absolutely. So we're very similarly, we're taking money out of the individual workstation component, mm -hmm. uh, removing storage, because that's not as necessary and, and our focus is on the shared spaces, so offering many different types of those as well as technology. So what we're finding is where historically we might not have put technology, one to two person rooms, we're starting to look at that. So we're looking at smaller 32 inch monitors and maybe a booth area, right, where you might have two people collaborating with a third person who's virtual. Right. Thinking about how these small huddle spaces will have technology support, uh, ubiquitous wireless, is something that we're striving for mm -hmm. um, and getting away from sort of some of these, I'll call it, this is beautiful, right? We're not putting this in our workstations, <laughs> right? So getting away from those types of solutions. <laughs> <laughs> we, we want it where the brand is, right? <laughs> um, and uh, Tina, has it? What's your experience been on this area? So, um, with regard to our, our new headquarters and, and the design that we're working on there, the space that we're going into is is actually very lovely space today, um, but we need to change 
the look. We, we want it to look like VA systems. So, um, so we're really focused, um, as Stephen puts it, we're, we're doing this surgically. Um, we're, we're taking the spaces that um, employees and um, potential new employees will be walking in um, and, and creating this open environment so, um, so they kind of get the wow and this is great, this is VA systems. Um, so so we're, we're really spending our money there. We're spending our money too on the collaboration spaces. Um, the offices are really all in place, so um, so really making those unique spaces, um, you know, something that the employees want to go to and they're drawn to. Um, and we're also, um, you know, looking at spending money on this conference center. Um, this is this is new to us. We're we're able to um, pull in all of the conferences that we do have for our functional areas. Um, you know, we have we have about. Um, 10 conferences a year um, and about 125 training sessions um, annually that we hold internally, but we end up renting space. Um, so, you know, so we're, we're really focused on making those, those nice spaces as well. Um, the other piece that we are really investing on, and this, was, this goes back to the survey I mentioned initially, um, besides commute, the other piece that people um, were really interested in, in getting right was our technology. Um, so, you know, we, we are located um, across the world. We do a lot of telepresence video type conferencing. Um, so making sure that that technology is easy to use, um, is available when you need it, and you have enough of it um, to be able to support the meetings that need to happen is, is very important. Um, we, we currently, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of people who do work from home. Um, so we currently are, are beefing up that technology as well. So it's easier for people to use their laptops, log in, without going through all of these different steps. So, you know, it's basically you open up your laptop, you put in one password, and you're in the system. So that's something that we've already created, but these other things um, from an IT technology standpoint are very important to us. I would love to hear from you all, and Caroline, I know that um, you have some experience with this. Um, how are you programming these spaces? Um, how, what kinds of um, you know, local events and um, kind of offerings are you incorporating into these spaces to help build a sense of community um, and to kind of supplement the um, more flexible work environment? Yeah, so I think that's a really key question. So we are actually, um, with this new building, we are, from a properties perspective, um, looking to provide two new roles to support the building of community and to support the fact that we are in a free address, free address environment for um, this population. Um, the first role is a role that we're calling our workplace experience coordinator. And the, that role is really going to be responsible for working with the um, uh, within the neighborhoods on each of the floors in doing things like proactive actively looking at you know, conference room bookings and um, supporting folks with how, with kind of change management after the move in. So how do they use the space? How do we really kind of um, internalize some of the new behavioral norms that are gonna go along with this? So that role will be uh, looking to help cultivate um, along with some Alina business partners um, in the space, um, uh, kind of the culture, the cultural and behavioral norms that'll, that'll need to be uh, uh, done to accommodate this. Um, the second role that we're um, providing as well is what we're calling a community advocate role. And this role is going to be one that's responsible for um, basically curating the programming and building community within the, within the location, within the market. Um, so doing things like reaching out to our different team member networks across the footprint um, and hosting events, um, working with our HR groups to bring in um, wellness checks and other things into the building. So how can we start to create activities and curate and program events that the uh, team members are going to find um, useful? Doing things like monthly donuts and coffee where we may host on the first floor um, an open house for folks in the building to come down and have free 
you know, coffee and just connect and build network? How do we know um, and can we start to do things like advertising, um, key milestone anniversaries mm -hmm. for different team members in the building and put that in on the digital signage so we're actually acknowledging individuals that work in the building when they come into the space. So how do we think about really providing the environment for our team members to feel as if they belong, as if they have a sense of community, and as if they are part of uh, the Wells Fargo um, culture um, and that they're supported, so. Uh, Steven, it, are the architects a part of that conversation at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're part of the conversation from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So those, and, and, and our influence on that is helping to, once we've kind of heard the abstracts, how do we help create the environments that support that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and what the construct might be going in may not be the construct when we're done. Mm. Okay. Meaning that they may think, well, maybe we need this, these types of rooms. You know, the, the program might be, I need uh, for 100 people, I need uh, 100 spaces to support these people in huddle type focus rooms and things like that. But maybe not, maybe, mm -hmm. okay. So that's, that's where we have the dialogue to understand maybe there are new ways to be working, you know, involving our consulting group uh, who are also always looking at the forefront of new ways of, of working, new working patterns, um, how we can help influence that, what type of new furniture solutions are there out there that can create virtual rooms. You know, in the back area, we've got these kind of three-sided uh, sofas or chairs that create uh, a virtual room. Mm. Um, or that, that framework unit that we have back there that's, again, another choice of environment. But it creates, it's not something that would necessarily go into a program as a room, but you're creating a space. So what we're offering or what we would be doing is showing the dialogue of showing the different options of how you can actually work and then dialoguing that with you know Caroline or Michelle or Tina on will that work all right the design's done the team's moved in how are you all evaluating success in these environments um, Michelle would you like to, to start Sure. Um, pre and post occupancy surveys mm-hmm so we're doing a, a pre-occupancy survey. We've s recently surveyed the entire workforce. And you know, circling back to the programming question um, and your comment about ratios, you know, looking at what the right ratios are of collaborative spaces. So taking that survey, which was a combination of you know, your, your experience in your role mm -hmm. as a professional working for an organization versus how effective is your workplace environment in supporting that role taking that feedback, translating it into, okay, we know we need an industry standard of one-to-one -one ratio, dedicated seat to alternate workplace, but working with the professionals in the world, the field, like the A&E team to define what is the ratio of type of spaces in that alternate workplace environment. So going back to heads down individual telephone rooms, two person, four person, six person conference rooms, recovery spaces, mm -hmm. you know, those sorts of amenities. So when we look at the post-occupancy, we typically are doing that. This is not anything new to most people. We're doing that four to six months after occupancy. Mm -hmm. And we're also speaking ongoing with HR and management to better understand the individual ongoing feedback that they're providing to them. So in some cases, we'll even do focus groups. So. One of the things that we're actually doing as well, in addition to the pre and post surveys, um, is we're starting to um, look at ethnography um, within the folks. So uh, actually our team is going in a couple weeks and we're uh, all being trained on how to um, uh, conduct interviews and do observation and then analyze that information in a qualitative way um, back so that we can start to inform decisions. So it's actually sitting down with the individuals using the space, um, how, to, how to effectively interview them, how to observe them in their, um, in their location, 
um, and identify the enablers and the disablers for how they can effectively do their work. So the ethnography piece is a big part of what we're starting to introduce as well and start to explore to see how it can inform um, the success of the, um, of the solutions and, um, and where we can continue to look to evolve. Right. Tina, same with you. Uh, on, on schedule and on budget. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, no I, I, I think for us, um, so I, I mentioned that we're consolidating these four locations and we, we have about 320, it'll, it'll probably be around 350 people that will be moving into the space. Um, I, I have the um, opportunity to talk to basically every one of those people and um, we, we did uh, initially back in December we met with about 150 of those people to find out um, not only the programming aspect, so how many seats do you need, um, but what they wanted to see in the environment um, and what they liked about their current workplace and what they disliked about it. Um, so, so I think as we, as we tick off those things that they said, um, and, and for me the big thing will be um, you know, the buzz in the space. Um, and and the, the feedback that we get on on whether or not we kind of hit the mark um, I think that we will we will see um, it, the the use of the conference center um, I think will be a huge huge opportunity for us and and so for me from a, uh, an operational standpoint um, you know really making that right and and having people coming back um, you know two three four times just just to experience that and continue to experience it, I think will be uh, kind of where we, we hit the mark. Well, um, I got the wrap it up signal from Daniel. Um, so this will be my last question. We're going to transition into audience Q&A. So if you all want to start thinking about questions you might want to ask of the panel, um, please do. Um, I just would love to ask a question to all four of you, which is, what are you most excited to kind of see the trajectory of over the next five years, be it an element of a project you're working on, a trend, uh, a new kind of product potentially being developed? Um, Tina, I'd love to start with you. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited about you know, the, the mobility piece mm -hmm. um, and, and how people are gonna continue to be more, more mobile, more agile. Um, in the work that we do, um, and how that's going to allow us to uh, create more products, um, better products, um, products that we're currently using, and make them more efficient. Um, and 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 I just I just think that you know as we um, become more agile, we'll be able to to put better products out there. And I think that's really important for our company and and for our military. Yeah. Michelle, what about you? I would say flexibility, yeah. um, really seeing what the future looks like in terms of creating truly flexible, customizable environments that will support employees' individual work styles mm -hmm. and physical and psychological needs. Yeah. I think uh, kind of tagging along here, um, for, for me it really is um, looking at the technology advances of the next five years and you know who could predict five years ago that we'd be where we are right now but um, and, and I can't even envision where we're heading um, from that perspective so um, the integration of technology into the um, into the very fabric of how we do our jobs, how we engage with our services, the smart buildings, the um, smart furniture, um, you know the, the ability to actually monitor real-time utilization of spaces and tie all that back in. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm excited about where we're heading on that front and honestly slightly um, scared um, <laughs> <laughs> where that might take us as well. And Stephen? Uh, to me, I, I'm excited at all three of the different groups because as, as an architect, our basic role is as problem solver. Right. Okay hearing um, what is not really being said, but is being kind of, um, what is not being said is just as important to me. Uh, and understanding how, as a problem solver, we can create and help support architecturally, because architecture is only a component mm. of a full environment. Right. As we said, it involves technology, it involves HR, okay? Uh, and our component of it 
which becomes more holistic because we are not just this is what we do, this is what you do. Right. Okay, we're kind of uh, kind of the we bring it all. Hopefully, we can bring it all together to make uh, Wells Fargo solution Wells Fargo solution. Mm -hmm. BAE solution, BAE solution, Freddie Mac solution, Freddie Mac solution, so that their cultures are being advanced. And that's really what the exciting part to, to, to I think, HOK is. Well, thank you so much, all four of you. Uh, I think Daniel is going to take over the mic for a second and help us with the Q&A. Awesome, well, so first, thank you to our panel and Lila for moderating a great discussion. So like uh, it's been mentioned, we do have time for questions, uh, questions and answers. Um, the only thing I would ask is that you wait to have the microphone so that the folks tuning in live can uh, hear the question as, as well as our panelists. So with that, um, questions? Hello. Uh, I would like to ask you what you think about um, territoriality. I teach college students and they sit in the same seat every semester, <laughs> not even just every class. Um, so how do you deal with territoriality when you're trying to have this agile environment? Is that because they're creatures of habit? Yeah. People are creatures of habit. People are creatures of habit, most certainly. It's Oh, sure. We can tick and tie. So um, territoriality can be a good or bad thing, right? And sometimes it's a little bit of both. So if I go back to our neighborhood scenario, right, where you have a team that's dedicated to a location, they may not have assigned seats. Um, we're, and we look at that space surrounded by collaborative space, we want that collaborative space to be owned and maintained by that team. So there's some workplace protocols that can be managed by the team instead of the HR. So in that aspect, it's good. From a individual kind of coming into a free address system and squatting, that, that's a no-no, right? Um, what we used to do in some of my previous roles is we limit the time or number of days consecutively that they could, re they could reserve that seat. So you could be in a neighborhood, you had access to full reservation rights, but if you were consistently occupying the same seat for more than three consecutive days, you were bumped. Yeah, and uh, actually we're looking at it um, um, slightly differently where we actually are not allowing any reservations anywhere in uh, the neighborhood, so everything in the neighborhood is kind of first come, first serve. Um, so we're anticipating a couple of things will likely happen. One is people may squat, right? They may sit in the same spot every day, but I will tell you that one of the roles, our workplace coordinator role, um, is going to be going around and kind of on a nightly basis, just moving everything to a central location. So if you leave your water bottle, it'll get moved. If you leave your sweater on the chair, it'll get moved. So there won't be any outward signs that anyone is squatting. So if someone the next day comes and, you know, sits in that spot, then great. Um, if that person continues to beat the traffic and get that spot first, that's fine too. We don't have any preference around that and we're not trying to force behavior in a different way, but we want to make sure that everything is available um, um, for the folks. The, the second thing is we're actually allowing for and supporting what we're kind of internally calling a HOA, a homeowners association kind of a, a thing within our neighborhoods where we're going to um, uh, ask for someone within the line of business to play a role in helping to create kind of what are the behavioral norms for those neighborhoods. So we don't need to dictate to anyone, you know, necessarily can you be in the, in the focus room for no longer than two hours but they may want to make those norms themselves. And if they make those norms, then they're a heck of a lot more likely to adhere to them um, and to be able and feel comfortable calling one another out if someone isn't following those norms. So we're, we're looking to kind of engage the line of business within those neighborhoods to help with some of the self-governance, uh, self if you will. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you guys for putting this panel together and really positioning yourselves as thought leaders on this conversation. As a millennial myself, I know the impact 
of workplace spaces, and so in about six years, Deloitte projects that we will comprise 75% of the workforce. So I think this conversation is hugely important. Um, so since this conversation is centered around the age of Amazon, um, Amazon's success as a company is largely attributed to their user-centric research, um, gathering insights on behaviors, relevant um, preferences, pain points. Um, so my question is for all of you, um, uh, Tina, Caroline, and, um, and the rest of you. I know that you guys have pointed on some of your internal um, tactics and user surveys and focus groups, so I applaud you on that and really kind of gathering employee and user, if you will, input in some of the workplaces you're designing. Um, my question for you, Stephen, is as an architect, do you challenge your clients on gathering that input to ensure that the spaces that you are designing are in fact you know, helping them not only attract but also retain um, these employees? Because Deloitte also projects that millennials stay within a company on average about two years. So. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned earlier, sometimes we'll get a program from a client, especially a client like, like a Wells Fargo or even a GSK where they have a set program at GSK, we called it the machine, uh, or the computer, it was called the computer, where you actually, you plugged in the number of people and it told you exactly, based on their algorithms, how many of this type of space, how many of this type of space, how many of this type of space. That is a guideline only. That's only a starting point, okay? Because it's an abstract concept, it's an abstract construct. You then have to actually talk to people to understand how they're going to be using the spaces. Um, and then also, you, you should be able to, and we do challenge our clients to say, well, is this the right type of space, or have you considered this type of space? So, uh, because we're constantly looking and creating new types of environments, that don't always fall into the five necessary programming buckets, okay? Uh, we have to be able to be agile enough to say to our clients, well, this is a new uh, solution, have you thought about this? Or this is a new solution, have you thought about that? And then we start having dialogue on going through it, and we might go take field trips or whatever it is, but um, it starts out it might start out with something abstract, something, a framework, but it always turns into a conversation. Oh, most certainly. Yeah, but can you compete the, repeat the question for? Yeah, if you could say it again. Oh, sure. I was asking, would you say that um, user experience is kind of leading the innovations in softwares and websites and uh, mobile applications? Would you say that interior design is probably the next industry to really kind of jump on that momentum and really leverage what user experience is and how that really creates uh, spaces or solutions that are successful? Well, I think we're already there. Yeah. Okay. I mean. Uh, we are not designing just environments. We are designing user experiences, okay? And as I, I was, as I was saying, it's not just about kind of the physical environment, but what are the technologies that are being brought in? What are the human-centric elements like food, okay? Like beverage, you know, how are we supporting a holistic environment and not just the physical environment? And, and if I can add, if I can add to that um, as well, I think one of the one of the um, things that we've recognized internally, and actually it, it, it is causing a bit of an internal um, stress point for us, is that um, because people are working differently today than they were even five years ago, the way that the space needs to perform is so significantly different to support the new work environment. Um, that, you know, if you are doing um, any realm of agile work as your primary force, you have visual elements that are plastered on walls that need to move with you as you move throughout the space that you need to have visual access to. You need artifacts and elements that you can see that are work, right? And those are not the pretty 
um, curated lovely bookshelves or, um, or elements that we can plan, right? We want to empower our team members to actually um, embody and embrace the space as a diff as a new tool, as a tool for what they need to do, and what they need to do is visual, and it may be really messy. So internally, we're having to step back and say, "Ay, uh, maybe this isn't you know the architectural digest shot." for what the space needs to look like, but it's really supporting the function of the people that are living in the space, and that may not always be the prettiest, um, most aesthetically pleasing um, uh, result, so. But if it's done in a controlled manner. <laughs> so, so for example, uh, on, on, on the project, we've got um, these scrum spaces, okay? Which, right, right? Scrum spaces are gonna be messy, no question about it. But we've confined them within an area to say, here, you're gonna be messy, be messy here. And we also have brought the whiteboard rails out into the space yes. so they can take the whiteboards from the scrum rooms back into their space and put them on the wall where they actually can see it as well. So it's, it's how do we balance yes. We have to balance. How do we balance it's a conversation. our <laughs> our, our um, both both of our perspectives yeah. on this? Yeah, we have a question back here. How you doing? Um, I'm with the federal government, and one of the things we're doing with the agency locally, we went from open office environments to balanced office environments with the use of design thinking methods. Um, I heard a lot of design thinking terms here in the human centered design thinking terms. Can you speak on two things? How do you make decisions between trends and paradigm shifts in your space and your products? And also, what are some of the design thinking elements that you've used to make your space different from the next person beside you? I'm, I'll start on that one, maybe. Um, uh, with uh, design thinking for, um, for Wells Fargo, um, we actually are, are using that all across the board and um, you know so those techniques those um, uh, those processes are embedded in how we engage with our teams and how we learn and you know a lot of the ethnography training that we're doing is kind of even um, coming from that um, from that frame um, design thinking is something that we are seeing pop up organically across all of the different lines of businesses within our organization. And because of people saying, I need X, or I need Y, or I need more wall space, or I need more X, Y, Z um, elements in the space, um, we, 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 we look at that and um, kind of track how much of that are we seeing and from what variety of places are we seeing those requests come from? And what I will say is that both design thinking and I kind of loop design thinking in with the agile framework, especially with the agile inspired framework a lot, um, those um, requests have popped up in every single one of our lines of businesses, which tells, and in all of our geographies, which tells me that this is something more than a trend. This isn't, you know, oh, we had one isolated or two isolated um, requests for something like this. This is everywhere, and we're just seeing it manifest, like, uh, just, just um, ex exponentially over the course of this, which is why our, um, why this project in Charlotte for us, um, in designing in this new way, I'm really viewing as our first foray into what will become, uh, I believe, the new standard way that we deliver on the majority of our spaces within the portfolio, not just the technology team. This is not a technology solution. This is a line of business solution for the vast majority of the types of groups that work within our organization because it's just the way that we're seeing work evolve and change. Question right here. So full disclosure, I come from an open workspace um, so I wanted to understand, how do you deal with um, employee health? And you talked about, you know, messiness and, you know, things like that. How do you, when you're designing and selecting products, how do you design and select products with employee health in mind so that people aren't constantly getting sick? 
So there are certain, th certain things you can do from an architectural and furniture solution basis, but then there are certain things that need to be done from um, a maintenance okay, basis. So there are, um, again, looking to healthcare uh, for workplace solutions, there are antimicrobial surfaces uh, that you would use for your horizontal surfaces. But then in addition to that, um, if you are in an agile environment, you make sure that you've got hand wipes and surface wipes clearly displayed throughout so that people can, in fact, um, clean their surfaces before they start working in them. So some of it is behavioral, uh, some of it is part of materiality, but it's, a, it's a, again, it's a combination of things. There's not one solution. And I'll just, I'll just add to that. Um, from the, the standpoint of the IT and the technology, um, you know, we, we've really seen, we, we don't see a lot of sick people in our office anymore. Um, they just don't come in. They can work from home. If you're sneezing and coughing, um, you can still work. Um, you have the flexibility to do that from anywhere, so um, we're we're really you know strong about that, and um, we don't want to see people you know in the space um, infecting everybody else. It just it's just not efficient, um, and it's just not the right thing to do. So we've we've really made that a point across um, our, across our business. We are um, also for the locations where we are in free address. Um, we are uh, um, adding additional janitorial and wipe down. So the scope of janitorial support in those um, facilities is significantly increasing um, with you know, uh, how frequently they're wiping things down all the way and what the cleaning looks like and all of that. So, um, so we're acknowledging that there is that. Um, there also are things that um, depending on who you are and what your um, what your preference and or concern around um, uh, exposure to, to germs and other things like that is um, you know you may want certain equipment to just be your equipment that you're not sharing in which case that's perfectly fine you can bring your own equipment we also have shared equipment we're providing wipes as well so if you forget something you can you know you can wipe something down and, and use it for that day um, certainly all headsets are going to be personal right you're not you know, nobody just going to share a headset, um, uh, you know things like things like that. So we're providing a lot of um, choice for individuals. They can bring their keyboards if they want, or there's going to be a keyboard there on the on the desk if they're comfortable with that as well um, that they can use. So those are just uh, some of the things. And then you know. It, at this with this day and age, it kind of goes without saying that um, uh, our our buildings are all very highly sustainable. We're all LEED certified, and we're also employing many of the um, guidance that the well building um, uh, groups are are suggesting as well. So, from an acoustic, from a light, from a view, from biophilia, from health and well being, those are kind of desk now integrated air, water. It's all integrated into the space. So we're really uh, we we place a high degree of value on ensuring that our buildings are as healthy as they can be for our team members. So you mentioned uh, hospitality as one of the sector that you look at for inspiration. Uh, could you share a little bit more about like as you enter a, a, like building hospitality building, what are you trying to see and what's your um, some takeaways that you learn out of that sector? So, you know, understanding what the core of hospitality is, which is kind of escapism, and providing it a type of environment um, that you don't necessarily have in your normal, everyday environment. So, uh, this project that we're doing for McKinsey in um, Atlanta, for example, uh, the lighting that is in the reception lobby is what you might find in a hotel lobby. Okay, it's beautiful crystals. It's so uh, bringing in things that are unexpected, and you have to look outside of the world of comfort. You have to look outside of the world of this is what I know the catalog of choices to be. Okay, um, or you have to create something that is truly bespoke for that, and that's what hospitality is. Hospitality is not poking. You know, corporate corporate work tends to be very catalog based okay we've got these five solutions let's choose one hospitality is very bespoke based it's very customized 
It's very unique to the environment. Uh, sometimes it's themey, sometimes it's not. Depends on what, what you're doing. So you have to kind of let your guard down and open yourselves up to the ideas that you have to look, that you, to really, really create a unique environment, you have to look beyond the world of the normal. And, and that's where hospitality comes in because once you've storyboarded what the, the construct is for the theme, then it's just a matter of how you, how you achieve it. I, I think the one other thing that I would add um, is that um, hospitality for us not only is the space, but it's so much about the service. Yes. Um, and it's the, you know, how do people feel and how do they engage with everything from the first point of entry in the space, um, you know, how are they greeted by the security, how does that process work, all the way through, you know, if you're a visitor in the space, what, what is the experience that you're going to encounter as you navigate your way back into the spaces that you're here or find the person that you're looking for. The service is a huge, huge part of that. And, and really looking at what is the kind of user journey of moving through their day, what does that look like is, um, is a big part in making sure that you have the right people that are um, in the right positions to engage and interact with people at those key, at those key points is, is a big piece as well. Yeah, so and that's where collaboration comes in and that's where you know having these types of dialogues because if, if we created solutions without our clients they would be vacant okay you need the communication the collaboration uh, and just the the symbiotic relationship to really create a unique space and that's what makes this so much fun so we only have time for one more question, but um, like I mentioned in the beginning of, of the discussion, we'll have about an hour to continue the conversation. So with that, I think there's a question in the middle here. Hello. Um, coming from a design background, I uh, was a designer 27 years ago and then manufacturing for the last 22 years. So back then there was very segmented uh, design. It was a corporate design, there was healthcare design, there was hospitality. Um, and it is all melting together. Hospitality is going healthcare, corporate's pulling hospitality, so everyone's kind of very interactive. On a manufacturing side, though, when it comes to design, uh, on our end, trying to produce material that appeases all of those environments are uh, uh, tasking, if you can say that. Um, so what do you look for as a client? Because the one thing you stated was you're not going to put that table in the common area, in the workplace, so you're going to be using the common areas. What what aesthetics are you looking for as a client when it comes to color or finishes and as an architectural standpoint, what are you looking for when it comes to manufacturing uh, in all these spaces? On the manufacturing side, um, I'm looking for products that help solve a problem. Okay, and as I mentioned earlier with the furniture solutions, I'm not necessarily finding some of those solutions, so we will we'll wind up having to create those solutions. But um, what I like working with manufacturers, uh, when, when I'm working with a manufacturer on a product, this is where, again, it becomes this collaborative type of, of element where um, you create something that neither one of you would be creating on your own. I'll give you another example where we're doing something um, we're doing an airport in New York right now, and we've got this huge arch that is eternally illuminated, and it is, uh, you know, it's 50 feet wide by 12 feet high, and it's held up on two points. And so, you know, we designed and detailed it out of glass and steel and made it look like a building, all right? Too big. So, we went to the hospitality world, to actually the entertainment world, okay, to a fabricator who makes casino um, parts for casinos. And they looked at it and said, sure, we can do this. And they whipped up some sketches and then all of a sudden, boom, it was done. So easy. But the point was we had to look outside of our normal world 
we had to look at the entertainment world to create something that's going in an airport. And I think that's, as designers, we need to be able to kind of look outside of our normal resources to uh, whatever is the right resource for the product to give us the right solution. I would add on that, you know, today the style of work is changing so rapidly and often we're implementing environments that we haven't tested. And we're looking to our manufacturing partners to help us test those solutions. And I kind of go back to form follows function. So if we think about agile workplace, which the word says it all, really flexibility, mobility, high tech, touch screens, communication, integration, and, and connectivity, um, we need product solutions that enable that, that have been fully tested and shown to be successful over time. We want to future-proof our workplace environments because we can't afford to buy a product today that is no longer relevant three years from now. We're still paying for it. We're still paying for it. It's still being <laughs> depreciated, right? Yeah. So that's, and, and what I really agree with is, is cross-organizational, cross-cultural, cross-manufacturing, cross-type integration. And that's where we're, get, we're seeing the most innovation happen, is when you have somebody who's doing something for a different reason in a different way, and they're bringing those solutions to us. And what we're taking, I look at the millennials as a, as a primary influencer, and coming at, going back to the influence that education has and hospitality, just because hospitality is essentially, I would say hospitality is also about experience. How do you experience the environment and how do you enhance the quality of that experience in that environment? So if we start there and we think about, you know, going back to how was your drive in? How were you greeted by security? What food service options were you provided? Was the menu diversified enough to satisfy, you know, multicultural background tastes? So things like that. Well, again, I would like to, to thank our panel and Lila for a captivating and really stimulating conversation. Um, and uh, just a few uh, announcements or comments um, before we close. Um, working on this discussion has been in the works for several months, and um, it's been great to partner with HOK. Like I mentioned, we've, we've um, partnered with HOK in several cities, but thrilled um, to be working with the Washington, D.C. office. And some of you might not be aware, but um, HOK just recently redesigned their workspace, and so they, w they had to really hustle to make sure that uh, this space was ready. And so sometimes you need that motivating factor. Um, but again, I really do want to thank all of the people that um, made this possible. Um, it was, you know, folks from HOK offices around North America. So um, thank you to HOK. Um, and thank, thank you for, for joining us both on our live stream and, and here in person. Like I mentioned, this is a uh, continuing education credit, so you can find myself or my colleague Jenny following the discussion so we can get you those credits. Um, but I, I would be remiss to not mention our think tank sponsors. Um, as you've heard, the, these types of discussions are incredibly important for the industry to grapple with innovations, issues that are going on. And without the support of our sponsors, it would not be possible. Um, so with that, I would like to acknowledge them and introduce uh, the representatives who are here with us in the audience. So for Washington, D.C., our think tank sponsors are BIFMA. And from BIFMA, we have Jennifer Walmack. Um, we have DXV Growy and Marcel Blowinski and Stacy Ng. So thank you to DXV Growy. Um, from DuPont, we have Fallon uh, Flaherty Air, and Ralph Crozier and June Bay. Thank you to DuPont. And from Versteel, we have Pam Mathias and Richard Ben. So thank you to um, Versteel and to our sponsors. It, on your chairs, you'll see that. Um, there's additional information on our sponsors, as well as Metropolis, HOK, um, and then also in the event program. But like I mentioned, there is a networking portion following. Um, lunch will be served, and I would encourage all of you to introduce yourselves to our sponsors because they're eager to be a resource for all of you. So with that, thank you, and uh, hopefully we can continue the conversation in just a few moments. <laughs>